should, of course, like always, receive the uh, notification that we started recording. All right. So um, <clears throat> for the past few weeks leading up into today, uh, Z has been ministering and done a phenomenal job in teaching. And, um, you know, that's what we do. We tag team together. I was a uh, a little under the weather as far as my voice. It was hoarse and I really couldn't talk sometimes and, and throat was dry, but she, that's what we do again as, as pastors. We we tag team in the ministry. When one can't go, the other one can, and you know, vice versa. We go at this thing together. We may ask others to help us out. So thank you guys for those who are who did and uh help who who did help us out and for Z who jumped in and, and did a great job on teaching the past few weeks. So, and she was talking about balance and boundaries. So let me go ahead and get started for tonight so we can get it in and we can get off and you guys can, can do whatever you do on a Thursday night after our fervent, uh, I'm sorry, after our Bible study. So if you would turn with me uh, to Genesis 18, Genesis 18, verse number one. So that's Genesis 18 and number one. Um. Let me read this first, and then we'll get started with, with Genesis 18 and 1. Persistence describes an attitude in life somewhere between tenacity and stubbornness. Persistence is about the way we approach a challenge, not the worthiness of the challenge itself. We can be as persistent in pursuing evil as in pursuing good. In general, persistence is more admirable than the tentative, blown by the wind, wayward approach that characterizes so many people's lives. So persistence describes an attitude in life somewhere between tenacity and stubbornness. It's all a persistence is all about the way we approach a challenge, not the worthiness of the challenge itself. So while you guys are in uh, Genesis 18, I'm going to read a verse from Psalm 145, and then we'll, we'll jump into Psalm uh, into Genesis. Psalm 145, verse 18 and 19 says this. The Lord is near to everyone who prays to him, to every faithful person who prays to him. He fills the needs of those who fear him. He hears their cries for help and save them. All right, now, Genesis 18 and one. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oak trees belonging, belonging to Mamre as he was sitting at the entrance of his tent during the hottest part of the day. Now, Mamre uh, in today's time is Hebron. That's where, uh, you know, it's called, it was called Mamre, M M-A-M-R-E, that's the plains of Mamre. That means he's just out and almost in the desert. Now that city today is called Hebron. So, you know, they, they built that area up now. So back then it was probably nothing, a few huts here, a few, you know, clay buildings, the way they used to construct their, their homes back then. It was in the plains. So it was hot. That means you really didn't have any shade. They were living in tents. Um, you really didn't have any shade back then, but you had some trees here and there throughout the area. So Abraham was sitting in the trees or in the plains, in the oak trees of Mamre, in his tent, in the entrance of his tent. So he had the, the entrance of his tent folded back. So he's just sitting there chilling in the hottest part of the day because during the hottest part of the day, uh, a lot of times they would like to rest and relax and try to cool off. And then as the sun began to set, then they could continue their day. Excuse me, because you got to remember back then in the, excuse me, one second. In the, um, 
in the in the desert part of of of, of, um, of Mamre, it gets really hot. So they're trying to stay cool, as cool as they can before the sun sets. And then when the sun sets, they're able to move and, and do and finish their job and their task. <laughs> Excuse me. As he was sitting at the entrance of his tent during the hottest part of the day, Abraham looked up and suddenly he saw three men standing near. When he saw them, he ran to meet them and he bowed his, with his face touching the ground. Please, sir, Abraham said, stop by to visit me for a while. Why don't we let someone bring a little water? After you wash your feet, you can stretch out and rest under the tree. Let me bring some bread so that you can regain your strength. After that, you can leave since this is why you stopped by to visit me. So here it is, Abraham is, is sitting in his tent, relaxing, trying to stay cool. And while he's standing, sitting there trying to stay cool, he, he, he happens to look up and he sees three people, three men walking towards him. Now, in those days as well, when they saw visitors coming, they would run to greet them, to just as a show of respect, as a show of saying, hey, I'm welcoming you into my home. Come and rest. Sit with me. I know it's been a long journey from where you're coming from. It's hot out here. It's hospitality. So that's what Abraham did. He was showing these three men hospitality by going to them and saying, hey, uh, let me offer you some stuff. But in the midst of him going to these three men, he fell and bowed his face and touched the ground. He said he ran to meet them and bowed his face touching the ground. Now, when we invite people to our house, customary for the United States, not for all countries, but for the United States, when, when we invite people to our homes, we don't run up to them most of the time, unless we just greeted them because, because we haven't seen, seen them in quite some time. But when, when we invite them into our home or when we greet them, we don't bow down to them. Our faces do not touch the ground. But in Abraham's case, he bowed before the men and touched the ground with his face. Then he said, please, sir, stop, to, stop by to visit me for a while. Why don't we let someone bring a little water? After you wash your feet, you can stretch out and rest under the tree. Let me bring some bread so that you can regain your strength. After that, after you can leave, after that, you can leave since this is why you stopped by to visit me. They answered, that's fine. Do as you say. So they were telling him, go grab some water. You know, um, so Abraham hurried into the tent. He found Sarah. Sarah is his wife. He said, quick, you know. He said, get three measures of flour, knead it, and make bread. That means put your fingers into it, put your back into it, put your shoulders into it. Knead this bread and make, knead, knead this dough and make bread for these men. I have to feed our guests. But these guests just aren't any kind of guests or special kind of guests. Then Abraham ran to the herd and took one of his best calves. He gave it to his servant who prepared it quickly. Abraham took cheese and milk as well as the meat and he set these in front of them. Then he stood by them under the tree as they ate. They asked him, where is your wife, Sarah? He answered, over there in the tent. Uh, let me stop there for a second. So here it is, you have three men. Out of the blue, these three men walk up to just to, to Abraham's tent. Abraham runs to go and greet them. But as he's running towards him, there's an attraction that's happening as he's running towards these three men. And by the time he gets into the presence of these three men, he bows his face to the ground. Because the presence 
that these three men have on them is the presence of the Lord, is the presence in the anointing of the Almighty. The anointing that is flowing from these three men was so strong and powerful that he had to bow himself down before them. Now, in verse number three, he says, please, sir, stop by to visit me for a while. Stop by and hang out with me for a while because your presence the anointing that's on your life calls me to bow down before you. So there's something about you that I need for you to stop by and stay a little while so I can understand more of who you are. So his persistence going towards the men and asking them to stop, to stop, to stay, he was persistent in his asking because it's something about these guys that he need to learn more about. The persistence is about the way we approach. So the way he approached these guys was, 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 it was a feeling of acceptance in his spirit. So the way that he approached them told him something was different about who they are. And then when they, when, when, when he went to go find his, his, his wife, Sarah, he said, quickly, go get, go get food so we can, we can feed these guys, uh, bread so we can give these guys bread. And, and here's the best calf, uh, you know, told his servant, go prepare it. But while these guys are out running, preparing food and, and preparing bread, the men ask, where is your wife, Sarah? Abraham says, Sarah is over there in the tent. The Lord said, I promise I'll come back to you next year. At this time, and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Sarah happened to be listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were old. Sarah was past the age of childbearing. Stop right there for a sec. Now, here it is, you have three men again coming to see him. If he fixes the food, he does all of this stuff. They ask, where is his wife? And then the Lord says immediately out of his mouth, I promise I'll come back to you next year at this time and your wife Sarah will have a son. The Bible describes one of the three as being the Lord because it says the Lord said, I promise I'll come back here next year. And when I do, Come back here and visit you next year. Your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Scholars in the Bible describes the Lord when he takes on a human form as theophany. And that's T-H-E-O-P-H-N-Y. T-H-E-O-P-H-A-N-Y. Theophany. That's what Bible, schol Bible scholars say or describe the Lord when he takes on a human form on the earth. So the Lord took on a human form just to come and visit Abraham. He took on a human form just to come and talk to his servant, Abraham. Abraham, now in chapters 12 and chapters 15 of Genesis, at one point it says the Lord appeared to Abram. And in another chapter, it says 
uh, the Lord uh, uh, visited Abram in his in, in a dream. So that means the Lord had already previously visited Abram twice before this third time right here in, in Genesis 18. But notice I said when the Lord appeared to him and when the Lord visited him in his dreams, I didn't call him Abraham. I called him Abram. I called him Abram because his name had not yet been changed to Abraham. In chapters 12 and chapters 15, the Lord had promised Abram that he will be the father of many nations. He promised Abram that he would have a son. And when he made these promises to Abram, Abram at the time was 99 years old. His wife, Sarah, at the time was 90 years old. So there were promises that were made to Abram and to his wife. Promises that were told to them by the Lord. Once the Lord appeared to him in chapter 12 of Genesis, the second time the Lord appeared to him in a dream or a vision. The third time the Lord appeared to him again in form was in Genesis 18. Because no man can see God's face and live. But in this case, because the Lord decided to take on human form, to come and visit and to, 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 to visit Abram, and to specifically deliver a promise in person, it meant that you were a chosen person to carry out the assignment of the Lord. So Abraham was chosen to carry out the promise of the Lord. Abram was chosen. Abraham was made to carry out the promise. So there was a transitional period, period to where there was a change in his name. There was a change in his, in his countenance. There was a change in his, in his character. There was a change in his life. There was a change in his attitude. So when Abram became Abraham, he became the father of many. When he was just Abram, he was the exalted father. But when he became Abraham, now he became the father of many. So when the Lord said that I would be back here next year, and when I do return, your wife, Sarah, will have a child. Within herself, it says that, uh, that Sarah laughed. And, and so Sarah laughed to herself thinking, now that I've become old, will I enjoy myself again? What's more, my husband is old. The Lord asked Abram, why did Sarah laugh and say, can I really have a child that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will come back to you next year at this time and Sarah will have a son. So the Lord was asking Abraham, why did Sarah laugh within herself? Now, remember, Sarah was in a tent somewhere else, nowhere around, but she laughed within herself. So laughing within yourself, when somebody makes a remark or when somebody says fun, something funny or does something funny, you may not laugh out loud. You may not make the comment out loud. It's within yourself. It's your thoughts. But within herself, she laughed. But also within herself, the Lord still heard her. The Lord perceived and knew that she laughed within herself. And he asked her husband, Abraham, why is Sarah laughing within herself? I've come here in human form to deliver a promise to you, to tell you that you will have a child. Although you are old and your wife is old, I still have a promise to fulfill through you. 
So what I'm saying to each and everyone on this line, on the Zoom call tonight is this. It doesn't matter what time of the day, what year your age may say, how long it may take for something, something to happen, when it may show up, how it may show up. It may show up during the hottest times of your life. It may show up in the coolest days of your life. It may show up in the earliest part of the morning. Or it may show up in the midnight hour of the day. But it doesn't matter when it shows. But when it comes, it's delivering a promise. And when it delivers a promise, the promise will be upheld. And not only will the promise be upheld, the promise will manifest. So when the Lord comes specifically and specially, especially to come, when the Lord comes to, to appear before you, when the Lord sends a messenger, when the Lord sends a promise, when the Lord sends a sign, a sign, when the Lord makes a promise, the promise will be delivered and the promise will happen. No matter whether you have doubt within yourself, no matter whether you don't, it doesn't matter if you don't believe, it doesn't matter if you don't accept. But when the Lord has chosen you, it's nothing you can do to stop it. The Lord chose. The Lord chose Moses. When he even said, Father, I stuttered. The Lord chose Saul when he became Paul. Although Saul had been had murdered, tortured, destroyed people but he was still chosen. It doesn't matter that the son of man, the son of God was chosen. And let's be frank and let's be honest. He did not have to send his son. He could have destroyed the earth and wiped mankind out completely. But there was a promise made to his people. There was a promise made to his to his word. There was a promise made to the earth. There was a promise made to each and every one of you on this line tonight. There was a promise made. There was a promise made that you have spoken to strangers and you have entertained angels. There was a promise made that you have spoken to the Lord in human form, in theophany. There was a promise made that you will have your need met. There was a promise made that he said, I will never leave nor forsake you. There, were a, there was a promise made to you that you are the light. There was a promise made that said, I will create man in my likeness and in my image. There was a promise made that says, I will give you my spirit, which is that of the Holy Spirit. There was a promise made that I said, I will give you my son and he will die for the remission of your sins. I made a promise. That said, I will not destroy man again by water. I made a promise. I made a promise that you are my friend. I made a promise that you will inherit. I made a promise no matter your age, no matter your color, no matter your nationality. I made a promise that if you serve me and you serve me wholeheartedly, that you will enter into my kingdom. I made a promise. And in doing so, regardless, if you laugh within yourself, if you say that I don't know, 
If you say, I don't have a clue. If you say, I don't know which way to go. If you look and you begin to read the Bible, but you don't understand it, it doesn't matter because he said, I made a promise to you that my word will live in you always. I made a promise to you that I will have others to teach you the word that I have spoken. I have made many promises to my word. I have made many promises to my word. And can I tell you the word that he said that I've made many promises to? That word. I've made many promises to my word. And how are you saying how, how am I? The word, when he said, let me, let us make man in our image and likeness. So you became his word. You became his promise. You became his Sarah. You became his promise to say, by this time next year, when I return, you will have. So last year, when he spoke and said, I am coming for every word that proceeds out of your mouth. When I return next year, which is now the year 23, I am coming for your words. I'm coming now to balance you out and to make sure I keep you within your boundaries. I'm coming for my promise. I'm coming so that you can understand and know that when I promise you something, I will deliver. I will show up in human form just so you will believe and know that I'm here to deliver my promise. I'm here to deliver my word. Yes, you can go fix what you need to fix. Yes. You can go and prepare what you need to prepare. But while you are doing all of that preparing, I'm asking and I'm seeking to find where I need to deliver my promise, who I need to deliver my promise to. So then when you return to me, I can also tell you the promise that was been that has been said. So that now. Not only is there one witness, but there's two witnesses that the promise has been delivered. So in the year 22, I came for your words. Now in 23, I'm going to deliver the promise to you. So whether I, I said you will have, you will have. Whether I said you, will, you need, you will need it. You will get it. You will receive it. You will have it. Whether I said your sicknesses will leave you, they're gone. Whether I said you will have increase, the increase is, is coming. Whether the door was closed and I told you it will open, the door is wide open. If I said that I'm going to pick you up and you're going to walk, your legs now have strength. If I said your tongue will never no longer be closed or, 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 or clinging to the roof of your mouth and your lips will part and a sound will come out, I'm delivering the promise to you today. You will have the promise. The promise was to Peter when he said, Lord, bid me to walk out here with you. Jesus said, come. The promise was delivered to Peter to walk on the water. And Peter stepped out of the boat and began to walk on the water because the promise was delivered to him when Jesus said, come. The promise was delivered. The promise came in the form of the word come. And when he said come, Peter's legs began to strengthen. And as he stepped on the water, it was like he was stepping 
on the hard surface of the earth because the promise had been laid out underneath him. The promise delivered what was asked. The promise delivered what was said. The promise always delivers. When the Lord says, when the Lord visits, when the Lord guarantees, please know that it's going to always be delivered to you. It will never fail. It will never crumble. It will never destroy itself. Because the words cannot return to our Lord void. Therefore, it cannot destroy itself. That's why when, when the Lord asked Abram, why did Sarah laugh and say, can I really have a child now that I'm old? The Lord was asking Abraham, does Sarah not know first and foremost who I am? And secondly, does Sarah not understand that when I say a promise is going to happen, a promise will be delivered. A promise will not return back to me. Then he goes on to say, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for my promise to accomplish? Is anything too hard for my word because I spoke the word? I created speech. I created existence. So is anything too hard for me? Is anything too hard for my word to accomplish? When, 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 when you ask the Lord, Lord, is it meant for me to have? Lord, why am I in these situations? Lord, why not me? Lord, why me? You know, all these, all these, all these things you may say. Never doubt the fact that you are the promise. Never doubt the fact that when you begin to speak, not cry out, not beg, not fall out, not do, don't do any of that. But when you begin to speak to the Lord, speak with the authority of knowing the promise will deliver. Speak and know that when you begin to say, Lord, the promise is already fulfilling itself. The promise has already manifested. Don't laugh within yourself. Don't have doubt within yourself. Don't think about any other thing, but just have blinders on and concentrating on nothing but the promise. The same way you concentrate on your fears, the same way you concentrate on what you don't have, the same way you concentrate on whether somebody talked about you or didn't do right by you, the same effort that you put into those situations is the same effort you need to put into the promise. And I can guarantee you that if you put that amount of effort into the promise, all those other things will never ever rear, rear its head again, again to you because they mean nothing. Because those things cannot deliver like the promise can. Those things will only call agitation, frustration, hurt, doubt, uh, oh man. Oh, fear. Thank you, Z. Yeah, discouragement. Anxiety. Staying upset. Uncertainty. Unsure. You, you manifest those things to happen. 
And you then allow that blanket of those things that I just named to wrap around you. But when you let the promise overshadow you, when you let the promise come and eat with you, when you let the promise come and sit in the shade under the tree with you, when you allow the promise to walk around you, when you allow the promise to speak to you, when you allow the promise to look you in the eye, when you allow the promise to touch you, the promise will overtake you. The promise, again, will deliver. The promise will be there hanging. Around. The promise, on, like Facebook, the promise will befriend you. The promise will never unfriend you. The promise will give you inheritance. The promise will give you blessings. The promise will give you signs and wonders and miracles. The promise will give you healing. The promise will give you anointing. The promise will give you grace and mercy. The promise will give you birthing. The promise will relinquish pains and agony and defeat and destruction. The promise will deliver victory, triumph, joy, excitement. Because the joy is everlasting. The promise will never die. The promise even went as far as saying that, and I said this this past Saturday, that I have a mansion prepared for you. I have a, a home prepared for you. I'll, I'll even go as far as, 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 as wiping away every tear that you've ever shed. The promise always delivers. The promise relinquishes the pain, the, the, the blood clots, the cancer, the aneurysms, the heart attacks, uh, the broken bones, the, the, the skin disease, the, the, the speech impediments, the hearing loss. The the, 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 the the blindness, the headaches, the joint pains, the promises relinquishes all of those things. The doubt and whether you're going to advance in certain areas of your life, the promises, the promise relinquishes those things. The promise will detach you from all of those things. The promise says, take my yoke and learn of me. <laughs> My burdens are light. I guarantee if you if you yoke up with me, if you link up with me, the promise will take you into areas and cultivate you and take you into promised lands and give you milk and honey and give you substance and give you forever of blessings and enlargement of your tents and your territories and increasing your lives and and it. it Every time you look around, your eyes will see nothing but promise and blessings and overflow and, and rivers and, and fountains just flowing with the promise. The promise will always keep you saturated. You will never dry out, nor will you ever wither. The promise will keep you filled. So the promise told Sarah and the promise told Abraham that I, through this seed of Isaac, through your seed, Isaac, will give birth to Esau and Jacob, and it will become many nations. You will be the father in this, of many nations, and your descendants will be more than the mouth and the eye can count and see, because I made a promise to you. I made a promise, and I'm going to deliver on my promise. Because when the Lord shows up in, in, in human form, again, that's theophany. When he shows up in human form, he's coming for your words. He's coming to deliver his promise. He's coming for you. He's coming to deliver the word. And when he delivers the word, have no doubt 
but just have understanding like Abraham did. He fell to the ground with his face bowed because he recognized the Lord and he recognized the anointing. So that's it for tonight. And that's being persistent in understanding and knowing that the promise is here for you. And it's not going to leave you until it delivers what it was promised to deliver. So that's it. I'll turn it back over to Z. Wow, that was awesome, Marvin. What a powerful word tonight, uh, talking about persistence and promises on tonight. You know, uh, as he was talking, uh, I was writing these notes down and uh, one of the things it said that a promise is, is a legally binding declaration that gives the person to whom it is made a right to expect or to claim the performance of a specified act. Can I tell you in 2023, we need to expect the promises of God, have an expectation of the promises of God because his word will not come back to us void. And then you open up talking about persistence. It says how we, are, how we approach a challenge, how we approach a challenge. Um, and then you went on to talk about tenacity and stubbornness. My God, tenacity and stubbornness and being admirable. Uh, and then you said some people approach persistence like a blow by the wind approach. In other words, that means I can take it or leave it. You know, I'm not really persistent. It's there. I'll do a little bit. I'll do a little bit of that. But can I tell you, what if God blessed us that way? My God, it says he's, he's persistent with his promises. Uh, again, uh, balance and boundaries was the word that God has given us in 2023 and to expect the unexpected. And to expect the unexpected means we're going to expect these promises, these promises and these performances of these promises that God has called uh, that he will do for us. So I'm really excited about that. Persistence. Uh, anybody, another example in the Bible, Marvin, of uh, someone who was very persistent was also Paul, because Paul went from killing Christians to becoming one. He was, he was, he was persistent. I mean, he murdered a lot of people. He killed a lot of people, but then the very thing that he killed, he became it. And after he became it, he was so on fire for the Lord that he went through so much trials and persecution after he did that. See, that's the thing with the, the, the persistence of being a believer in Christ. A lot of times when we're persistent with God, there's these trials and tribulations start coming. And, but can I tell you that on the other side of that, Marvin told us tonight are the promises of God. If we are persistent in serving him because he's persistent in loving us. He was persistent when he died for us. Amen. He made a promise on the cross for us because he was persistent with the promise. From the beginning of time, he's been persistent with us. So I give him glory tonight for that. And then it also says in his word, and let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. The promises always prevails. Let me tell you tonight, we cannot grow weary in being persistent, amen? Marvin made very good comments about how people can be persistent in doing the wrong thing. They can be persistent in having a bad attitude. They can be persistent in being hateful. They can be persistent in being uh, conniving. They can be, per do I need to keep going on, amen? But how about we be persistent in believing what God said that his word will do for us. And tonight, according to what the prophet spoke tonight, he said that we can expect the promises of God to come to us. I'm excited in 2023. I'm expecting the promises because I know the words that were spoken in 2022 that my desires linked up with God's desires. So I spoke the desires of God. So I know in 2023, it's already coming to pass. So I thank you, Marvin, for tonight's word. I thank each and every one of you for joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to pray and, I'm gonna, and I want to say this. Thank you for hearing from God. Thank uh, God.